fait. Merci beaucoup Olivier, merci beaucoup Jean-Paul, euh, merci de nous avoir ben, fait confiance pour organiser ces deux jours. Euh, et puis aussi un tout grand merci à Median Group et Beatnik, Carmen et Doma. On a vraiment ben, conçu ces deux jours de programme autour de votre exposition ici. On a bénéficié aussi de votre complicité en termes de, 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 de conseils pour inviter les gens qui, qui participent à, ce, à ces deux jours. Et puis vraiment, enfin pour nous, l'exposition qui est en haut est vraiment un très bon résumé avec une très belle économie aussi finalement formelle de, euh, des grands thèmes qu'on euh, qu retrouve dans tous ces, toutes ces histoires de liens finalement bot, machine, euh, bot, humain. Voilà, c'est quelque chose qu'on qu a vraiment beaucoup apprécié de faire. Peut-être juste pourquoi on a nommé ce, ces deux jours « bot like me » C'est un rapport un peu ténu, mais c'est juste qu'on on réécoutait en préparant ça un vieux morceau de TV on the radio qui s'appelle Wolf Like Me, qui parle pas du tout de bottes, mais qui parle de loup-garou, mais qui, euh, qui en fait, dans les, dans les, euh, dans, finalement, dans les symboliques qu'il utilise en termes de, de métaphores de désir par ces personnages transformatifs, en fait, évoquait beaucoup des mêmes images finalement de transformation de peur, de perte de contrôle éventuelle aussi, qu'on va beaucoup retrouver, je pense, pendant ces, pendant ces deux jours. Donc voilà, c'est ce qu'on a un peu voulu développer. Voilà. Oui. Bonjour de moi aussi. Euh, ils m'ont dit euh, que j'ai déjà un bonus parce que je suis une Suisse allemande qui essaye de parler français, une Suisse allemande qui habite aussi à San Francisco et qui normalement euh, travaille en anglais. Oui, euh, en août 2015, on célèbre le site canadien de rencontre Ashley Madison et The Hacky. Euh, si vous avez déjà visité l'expo ou non, vous connaissez un peu le concept, mais le site était vraiment populaire euh, pour trouver quelqu'un, pour rencontrer, pour avoir une affaire. Et euh, pendant le hack à réaliser toutes les données, on a réalisé un truc très important, et c'était ça que 80% des femmes qui étaient sur le site n'étaient pas des vraies femmes, mais étaient des bottes. Des bottes qui sont en train d'avoir une conversation, qui sont en train de flirter avec les gens. Et uh, pas mal de gens, et des, des gens masculins, des personnes masculines qui étaient sur le site, c'était à peu près uh, 70 000 uh, de, de, de gens qui ont payé pour jusqu'à avoir une petite conversation avec les bottes et peut-être aussi ils sont tombés amoureux avec ces bottes. Et tous ces chats potes, ils ne sont pas des vraies femmes, mais ça euh, pose beaucoup de questions à nous. C'est aussi une question comment on peut créer une relation avec une machine, comment on pourrait être... Comment c'est plus difficile de aussi comprendre qui est la différence entre nous et nos machines et comment on échange, comment on a une conversation avec une machine. Nous sommes dans un temps où de plus en plus de machines intelligentes sont autour de nous. Euh, on a des titres ou des, des images comme ça un peu partout dans les médias. Euh, the rise of the robots. Et euh, il, y a, il y a des robots autour de nous. Et ça veut dire euh, automation, ça veut dire dans notre maison. Et ça veut dire aussi très personnellement. Et on appréciera encore de quel robot on parlait. De ce soir, on parle exactement et on a aussi invité un chercheur, Rolf Pfeiffer, qui va présenter après, juste pour nous dire un peu un, un overview où on a maintenant. On a des robots qui ont des formes physiques. On parle du robot humanoïde, ça c'est une possibilité. On a, on a déjà créé des programmes qui sont basés sur, de, sur des cerveaux, cerveaux et des réseaux cerveaux. Euh, on parle de euh, deep learning, par exemple, du Google. On a des formes d'intelligence artificielle qui contribuent à l'automation, mais qui croisent aussi le processus de computation, sont partout autour de nous. Nous et nos machines sont de plus en plus connectés et entremêlés. On s'assiste, on se contrôle et nous sommes dépendants l'un à l'autre. Depuis que nous créons des machines, plusieurs années, nous leur donnons une forme alors qu'elle les modifie à l'heure de notre compétence. L'élément le plus évident et aussi le phénomène le plus ancien, c'est bien sur l'automation crasant des moyens de production industrielle. Les rien à nouveau, sauf on verra que l'automation n'est pas forcément là où on pense. Le processus derrière n'est pas toujours visible et compréhensible. Ici, c'est une usine que, que j'ai visitée. 
euh, c'est Tesla qui est juste dehors San Francisco. Il n'y a presque pas de personnes. Euh, c'est une usine très très beau, hein, très design. C'est tout automatisé et euh, c'est complètement euh, ça a complètement euh, remplacé le travail manuel. Et toujours en Californie, cette image là, ça c'est une euh, équipe, une, la flotte de Uber qui est déjà automatisée. C'est encore dans une forme test, mais quand même, ça pose beaucoup de questions. Combien, combien des employés on va lui nécessairement Combien des voitures qui sont maintenant sur la rue, qui vont être automatisées dans 5 ou 10 ans Et ça remplace aussi du travail, ça remplace des gens, et ça va tout remplacer par des machines. Et ça va changer aussi, euh, ou développer aussi dans les, dans les euh, travaux un peu plus complexes. Ici, euh, on voit un ancien docteur qui, euh, qui, fait, qui analyse ses symptômes, qui parle avec euh, les esprits, la magie, pour comprendre qu ce qui se passe aux gens. Et maintenant, l'intelligence artificielle peut être aujourd'hui aussi analyser ces symptômes, comprendre des modèles et faire des suggestions aux gens. Ça, c'est un exemplaire. Elle appelle Ellie. C'est un thérapeute euh, intelligence artificielle. On pouvait parler de vos soucis, vos dépressions et vos soucis de santé avant de vous faire diagnostiquer. a été développé par l'Université de Southern California. D'autres jobs, jobs à haut revenu à très complexe devient l'assist et augmenté par l'intelligence artificielle. Le plus connu, c'est un avocat artificial intelligence qui s'appelle Ross. Ross peut comparer deux cas, recherche des enfants en ligne, euh, il comprend le loi, il peut faire des suggestions pour les clients. Bad Chops sont vraiment, euh, sont vraiment, euh, comme tu dis, sur, euh, ouais, gardés quoi. Euh, le BBC prévoit même dans une dans une étude que 50% du du jobs de maintenant pourrait être automati automatisé avant 2035. On a déjà des programmes pour des dessinés en ligne qui s'appellent Great, Online Marketing qui s'appelle Pesado, Office Manager qui s'appelle Petty, Accountant Software qui s'appelle Smack et plus en plus en plus du travail qui pourrait être remplacé par des machines. Et puis après, ce qui est intéressant, et c'est un autre point qu'on va aborder ce week-end, c'est que euh, non seulement il y a des processus d'automatisation dans un, dans un monde du travail étendu, mais aussi les, ces, ces mêmes entités automatiques, ces mêmes bots, contribuent aussi à créer de la culture, finalement, en, en répliquant le langage, en étant capable d'absorber de, 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 tout ce qui circule en termes de langage humain sur le web et de le redévelopper, toujours par les mêmes processus de, 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 de learning, en fait. On constate la même chose aujourd'hui euh, au niveau de... Voilà. On constate la même chose aussi au niveau de la, de la, de la création visuelle aujourd'hui. Donc euh, aussi là, des intelligences artificielles à nouveau modelées sur le neural network donc en mode deep learning qui permettent de, 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 de créer aujourd'hui des, des créations visuelles nouvelles basées sur des styles qui ont été appris par, euh, par, euh, par les bots. Ici, c'est euh, un software de l'EPFL, en fait, de Deep Art IO. Et puis, ben voilà, par exemple, des créations comme celle-ci, euh, on ne l'a pas beaucoup améliorée, là, mais là, c'est à nouveau de ces créations de, du, du Deep Dream de, de Google. Et puis aussi, on a de plus en plus, évidemment, une grosse présence de, de, de processus automatisés dans nos maisons qui nous aident à, voilà, à normaliser nos environnements et puis qui, très souvent aussi, re, euh, sont extrêmement proches, finalement, de l'appareillage de surveillance qui, jusqu'ici, était considéré comme un adversaire puis que, tout d'un coup, on commence à retrouver, en fait, dans nos environnements en ayant, nous, finalement, invités à y pénétrer. Et ça, c'est vraiment quelque chose de très important parce qu'aujourd'hui, ces systèmes, finalement, il marche que pour deux raisons. L'une, c'est vraiment 
l'ubiquité de ces systèmes de, de, de computation numérique euh, qui sont devenus de plus en plus petits et de plus en plus mobiles. Et puis l'autre, c'est simplement qu'ils euh, marchent parce que nous les abreuvons constamment de données. Et la plupart de ces données, nous, nous les donnons jusqu'ici volontairement. Nous commençons à vouloir freiner dans quelques zones, mais on se rend compte que c'est souvent déjà plus possible de reculer. Donc ça, c'est extrêmement important aussi. Donc voilà, que ce soit des, euh, des Fitbit ou autres appareils de, euh, qui, permettent, euh, qui permettent le Quantified Self aujourd'hui, c'est vraiment quelque chose d'extrêmement présent et on, on capte de plus en plus de données autour du corps humain, de nos, de nos sentiments. Et, euh, voilà. et puis ça va jusqu'à justement révéler des données très, euh, très intimes. Finalement. Ça c'est un autre euh, exemplaire Californie. Euh, oui, tu as parlé euh, d'être beaucoup plus intime avec nos machines. Ça, c'est un vibrateur euh, intelligent développé par des étudiants euh, à UC Berkeley. Ça veut dire que c'est un vibrateur qui peut, peut senser ce que, ce que te plaît, il peut apprendre, il peut adapter, il peut commencer à faire, donner un feedback, il peut commencer aussi à faire des propositions, recommandations. Et à la fin, tu peux sauvegarder votre euh, part, euh, pattern de plaisir pleasure pattern pour la prochaine fois ou aussi pour partager avec ton partenaire ou tes amis sur la cloud. Oui, et tout ça, plus en plus des machines qui sont autour de nous, les machines intelligentes qui nous connaissent, qui nous comprennent, qui, qui sait ce qu'on dit, ils ont aussi tout des données qu'on collecte. Chaque de nos mouvements est collecté, enregistré, potentiellement réutilisé et aussi vendu. On a effacé le middleman, de intermédiant, les données voyagent sans personne, sans interlocuteur. On ne sait plus qui contrôle les données. Ça pose beaucoup de questions. Qui possède ces données Combien d'informations est-ce que nous sommes confortables de partager Juste pour un service gratuit, par exemple qui a l'aperçu, que liste, qui, qui lise les termes et conditions et qui fait l'argent. Depuis 2-3 ans, on a déjà plus de bots en ligne que les humaines sur le web. Les bots sont dans les moteurs de recherche, des jeux vidéo, trading bots, spam bots, chatbots. Ils ont beaucoup et ils ont vite, ils ont assez facile de créer, diriger et dominer une conversation en ligne. Les grandes plateformes en ligne et social media deviennent de plus en plus des data monopoly. Facebook, par exemple, a annoncé leur Messenger Platform cette année, un service pour créer des bots pour l'interaction avec tous les utilisateurs du Facebook. Voilà, puis donc, simplement, on se retrouve dans des rapports de plus en plus étroits avec ces entités automatisées qui parfois nous ressemblent de plus en plus, qu'elles soient qu'elle soit manifestée sous forme physique ou qu'elle soit complètement finalement digitale, on s'en rapproche de plus en plus et à nouveau l'exposition que vous pouvez voir en haut est vraiment, joue beaucoup sur ces rapports extrêmement finalement euh, étroits et quand même malaisés avec, avec ces entités. Euh, et puis évidemment elle joue aussi sur, on en a déjà vaguement parlé, mais c'est vraiment aussi de savoir où est l'automatisation aujourd'hui, parce qu'on on en a tellement l'habitude qu'on attribue aussi euh, de, 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 des capacités automatiques finalement à des processus qui ne le sont pas encore. L'expo de Median Group Ebitnik le montre très bien aussi avec ses CAPTCHA qui sont reproduits à plusieurs endroits dans l'exposition et puis qui finalement sont dans notre monde aujourd'hui considérées comme une des dernières barrières euh, qui nous permet de rester à l'abri des bottes et qui finalement aujourd'hui sont aussi, sont aussi un rempart alors qu'on essaie de franchir via les algorithmes mais qui souvent sont finalement travaillés comme beaucoup d'autres tâches extrêmement méniales par euh, l'intermédiaire de, encore de beaucoup de gens qui font vraiment des petits jobs digitaux et qui font à longueur de journée des clics par exemple pour résoudre des captcha comme ça donc on a aujourd'hui dans le mythe dans les mythes du euh, du cloud et de l'automatisation complète, on trouve aussi encore énormément de gens qui font des petits jobs web, des petits jobs digitaux dont on a vraiment plus conscience et c'est aussi un des propos qu'on aimerait développer pendant ce week-end. Voilà. Alors pour venir maintenant au, à notre programme, vraiment, ce soir on va commencer avec 
les artistes, Carmen et Doma, Median Group et Bitnik, qui seront en conversation avec Rolf Pfeiffer. Rolf Pfeiffer, euh, grand pont de l'intelligence artificielle, d'abord à l'Université de Zurich, qui continue aujourd'hui son travail euh, surtout à Osaka, et qui vont un peu nous parler des différentes incarnations que ces intelligences artificielles peuvent prendre aujourd'hui, incarnation physique, incarnation purement digitale, distinguer les, les rapports qu'on peut avoir avec ces différents types d'intelligence, ça va vraiment nous permettre, on espère, de poser quelques bases qui nous suivront euh, demain. Et puis un peu plus tard, on, fait, on conclura cette première soirée par un concert d'un artiste italien qui est basé à Londres, euh, Not Waving, Alessio Natalizia, qui, euh, qui est aussi dans, son, dans sa musique, qui est vraiment une musique électronique, surtout de, 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 de synthétiseur, explore aussi finalement, en tout cas à mon avis, quelques-unes quelques de ses frontières très étroites entre, entre justement des perceptions complètement automatisées et des choses très humaines. Donc on se réjouit de l'entendre ce soir. Demain, pour ceux qui suivent, tout le week-end, on recommence à 14h30 avec deux intervenants helvétiques et un collectif parisien qui vont voilà, examiner un peu ce que sont les, les possibles manifestes autour du data qui sont possibles aujourd'hui, quelles sont les, les approches positives qu'on peut prendre au fait qu'il y ait une telle quantité de, de données qui soit aujourd'hui euh, en circulation libre et complète, qu'est-ce que ça a peut-être comme avantage pour l'éducation pour le partage du savoir, qu'est-ce que ça représente comme danger aussi au terme de monopolisation du, euh, des, des données, de leur utilisation et de leur monétisation, comment peut-être se réapproprier au niveau de l'individu qui fait finalement le beurre de ces grandes entités monopolistiques d'aujourd'hui, comment se réapproprier une partie du contrôle sur ces données. C'est des éléments qu'on examinera avec Hannes Gassert, Hannes Grassecker et le collectif Ribbon. Euh, un peu plus tard, dans l'après-midi, on reviendra sur ces questions vraiment de capacité technique, euh, d'infrastructure et de petits boulots du digital euh, d'aujourd'hui, pour tracer un peu ses frontières, où est l'automatisation, où est-ce qu'elle n'est pas, avec Patrick Keller et Nicolas Nova, qui nous présenteront euh, in extenso un projet euh, de recherche qu'ils ont mené euh, dans, dans plusieurs institutions suisses, entre l'ECAL, le PFL, la Haide à Genève euh, et le PFL plus ECAL Lab. Euh, qui s'appelle euh, II Cloud euh, Interfacing and euh, Interacting with the Cloud. Et donc là, on aura une modération de Marie Lechner et on aura aussi une présence d'Yves Citon qui interviendra comme une présence critique dans cette discussion. On terminera les, euh, les discussions demain avec une dernière conférence qu'on a intitulée Botocin and AlgoGhost. On a aujourd'hui, par la présence de ces entités automatisées, vraiment une création d'un monde qui finalement qui se, qui, qui se développe lui-même, qui, qui se réinvente lui-même et sur lequel on perd forcément un peu de contrôle et par rapport auquel on commence à redévelopper des superstitions et quasiment un, un rapport quasiment surnaturel qu'on avait quelque part perdu et puis justement par rapport à ça quels sont justement un peu quel, quel, quel type de présence quasiment fantomatique on peut déceler aujourd'hui dans cet univers purement digital c'est une question qu'on traitera avec Joël Vacheron, Nicolas Nova encore euh, on, aura, euh, on aura Tobias et euh, Nathalie qui nous rejoignent de Londres et puis euh, Jeff Guess et Gwenola Wagon voilà. donc ça c'est les conférences de demain et on finira à nouveau par un concert demain soir aux alentours de 20h30 avec des artistes parisiens Low Jack et puis Quentin Van Deval euh, donc Zaltan du label Antinote voilà. donc je laisse juste encore Sophie vous donner les petites précisions biographiques pour son intervenant d'aujourd'hui merci oui, mais maintenant, on a vraiment la chance d'écouter euh, Rolf Pfeiffer. Rolf Pfeiffer, Luc et, et moi, on se rencontrait il y a quelques années à San Francisco. Et déjà là-bas, on a réalisé qu'il est vraiment un chercheur qui a la capacité d'expliquer de euh, aux gens qu'est-ce qui passe vraiment euh, dans le monde euh, arti intelligence artificielle et comment ça est lié aussi au corps. So, toutes ces études sont autour de l'embodiment et la liaison avec l'intelligence artificielle. Il était pendant beaucoup d'années professeur de la computer science et le directeur du département Artificial Intelligence Lab à l'université de Zurich. Au moment où il travaille à l'université Osaka, il est juste venu du Japon spécialement pour nous. Et il, euh, il est aussi professeur euh, à Shanghai Chao Tong University en Chine. Il a écrit plusieurs, euh, plusieurs livres, Understanding Intelligence, 
c'était un et un, je pense, peut-être tu peux raconter plus tard et était aussi publié en français. Euh, bienvenue, Rolf Pfeiffer. Non, j'ai un micro ici. Comme ça. the wrong, it's projecting the wrong, uh, I think I need some help here, it's projecting the, uh, the notes, uh, how do I change the, uh, It's projecting the um, the lecture. How how do I change the uh, setting here? Ah, okay. I think that's probably. I need a sound here. Okay. Okay, so the introduction was in French. I was asked to do this in English, which I'm happy to do. So I will be talking mostly about robots. We can then talk about the connection between robots and other kinds of bots in the panel discussion. So I will talk about living with robots, next generation of intelligent machines, with a note on the robot hype. You'll see what I mean in just a second. I think, now I'm talking, when I talk about robotics here, I'm not talking about industrial robotics. I think industrial robotics is functioning very well. What I'm talking about is what people call service robots or social robots. So the robots that are basically amongst us, that share their living space with our own. So robotics 2016, that kind of robotics has a problem, and a big problem. So we asked random people how they see the future. A robot in the future. Can we have a bit? Um, I imagine them to be like in Will Smith's iRobot movie, and then they'll take over the world. They'll take over the world. Um, I see robots in the future, human-like, actually, because I think humans try to create themselves as machines. So that's exactly how I see robots. It should be intelligent, and it should uh, can uh, uh, to, uh, make uh, de de decisions itself. It fears me, but I think they will look like us. I think robots in the future will be very common in everyday life, like you meet him in a bus or something like this. <laughs> meet him in the bus. Okay, now I think there is a discrepancy between expectations that people have and reality expectations that come from the movie industry, Hollywood, and the reality. We have a short video. <laughs> Now the reality 
This is from the DARPA challenge, you know, the big uh, robotic challenge in the U.S. So that's the reality. And now if you look at this, this, so the expectation is that we have robots with perfect functionality like the ones you have seen in iRobot in the movie or uh, Ex Machina, personalities in a very polished look. If you, if you see the reality here on the right, there is a robot restaurant in China, in Hefei, big city in China. And these are called waiter robots and they have this toy-like look and they're essentially tin cans on wheels and all they have is a tray in front of them and they can follow this black line on the ground humans have to put the dishes onto the trays and then here down here the guests have to pick up the dishes from the trays and all these robots can do is basically carry the dishes from the kitchen to the tables and that's why in China already three restaurants with these robots have closed down again because these robots have absolutely no sensory motor manipulation functionality except following this black line on the ground. Now, I think we have a robotic hype. It actually started in December 2013. This news, this is from CBS News, it was in all the media all over the world. Google buys eight robotics companies in six months. Why? And so people thought, oh, wow. If Google is doing something, you know, if Google is buying robotics companies, this must be something very important. And since then, the media, not only technological media, but economic media, financial media, have been full of reports and very provocative reports about robots. Here, for example, Rise of the Robots. So there is a robotic hype. And it just came across this uh, article here, Spiegel Online 48, that's number 48, that's just two, two three weeks ago. And um, you know, it says basically an ostrich on wheels and you know, that computers, everybody, you know, Luke was talking before about deep learning, deep neural networks and how great that is and everything. But you can very easily fool these programs, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the detail, and you know, they would see basically an ostrich on wheels because, of course, there is no common sense. The computer doesn't know that ostriches don't have wheels, and the human would see a bus. So here is this illustration, Spiegel Online's very interesting article, I can really recommend it. Now about the back to the hype, um, investments in robotics, this is robotics overall, from 2014 to 2015, an increase in investments in robotics of 170%, which is more than double the investment of the previous year. This is unbelievable. There's hardly any discipline where something like that has happened. So I compiled a few pictures here from service robots, you know, Amazon, you know, this, this is a hamburger machine. This is, these, these are some uh, waiter robots, you know, with that limited functionality, vacuum cleaners, and you know all that. And then there is an area which I think has a lot of potential, which is called supportive technologies, medical, medical uh, supportive devices. If you look at this one here the, 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 with the crutches, this is called the rewalk suit. And so the idea is, that patients, paraplegic patients in wheelchairs, they can wear such a suit and then they can walk on crutches. Now, we just had a big event in Zurich called the Cybertlon, where uh, physically impaired people could use technologies and they'd compete in a, in a uh, competition. And one of them was with the rewalk suit and they trained the patients, some of the patients beforehand, and it's really amazing. It was very, very hard. They say it's extremely hard and very hard, and you know, it's three people standing around them in case a person would fall over. So not 
just you know get out of the wheelchair you know get the get the uh, the rewalk suit from the next shop put it on and you can walk freely on crutches nothing like that can be 5 years can be 10 years i think we have to have realistic expectations and many of the people that work in robotics i'm also guilty of that they have claims i mean uh, artificial intelligence basically has a history of false claims and here is a big danger that we have false claims again i think we have to be realistic and honest about this i compiled some so-called social robots they have virtually no functionality they are basically t iphones in in a tin can so they have no more functionality than we already have from an iphone and then you can ask yourself well why do you put it into a robot like that <laughs> the difference the main difference is that the iphone you can actually put here in your pocket whereas these robots you have to carry around you know it's very heavy so it's, you also can see they all look a, look a bit the same and then i was at a conference in beijing just i mean the, the chinese government is now really trying to push robotics and want to make make china the number one um, country in robotics world robot conference wrc just a uh, month uh, months ago six weeks ago and i just walked through the exhibition and took some pictures from these robots now look at them in all these companies venture cap there is venture capital uh, investments and they all look the same they have the functionality of an iphone nothing more all different companies all different companies you know in all of them investors they all look the same they all do the same thing functionality of an iphone why build a robot now most of you i'm sure know this robot pepper uh, softbank is a telecommunications giant in japan also very strong in the u.s business oh, there's a video of a little girl interacting with it and the reality is that if you interact with pepper and i'm sure you have seen that after about five minutes i mean if you're an adult i mean these girls you know they're i don't know how, how old they are but as an adult after five minutes or at the latest after 10 minutes you get bored now what's the problem one of the problems is that pepper and the i think nestle bought uh, a lot of these uh, pepper robots for their shops here is one in uh, tokyo and pepper can talk or can give you information about the latest features of Nespresso machines but it won't be able to make coffee for you because it doesn't have any sensory motor abilities that's what people call a social robot and this is just a very recent also a very recent article in in Spiegel it says pepper hello this is a report about a story why a stupid robot makes headlines internationally very good i could really recommend this article as well we also tried our luck at social robots here is one that was also in all the media like robo hey, listen i want to show you how i can feel i can, I can be feel. happy <laughs> i can be shy I can be surprised. Ooh. <laughs> I can be angry. <laughs> I can blink with my eye. And so on. So you, you, you get the idea. So this is actually cheating. You know, we just have a text-to-speech program. There is a, a programmer that types the text and then Roboy can actually utter it. And one of the sentences that it says also is, by the way, I don't understand what I'm saying. So it's all cheating, but people tend to believe what these uh, robots say. Now, these social robots, as they're called, if we do a reality check, mostly this children's toy look, social interaction, but lack of manipulation skills, movement and locomotion are very limited, you know, following a black line on the ground, maybe wave, waving a little, making some faces, novelty wears off very quickly and in essence they have the functionality of an iphone and a full featured humanoid robot is nowhere near in sight okay because i'm saying this because i've been talking to investment bankers and you know they really thought 
Ah, now we can have, a, you know, robots that walk on two legs, they carry a tray, you know, they take orders and, you know, forget it. Technology is nowhere near that level. Now, what if all this was in danger? Did we miss something important? And the backfire, you know, of these expectations, I think maybe I should mention this. The robot technology is in good shape. That's not the problem. The problem is how we communicate about the robots. The expectations are much too high. And the backfire now is already starting. People get frustrated. Most people, I'm sure most of you have seen, who has seen the uh, big dog videos? Oh, don't see any hands, nobody, huh? Oh, some people, I can't see anything here because of the, because of the light. Anyhow, so most, I assume that most of you have seen the big dog video on the Atlas you know, by Boston Dynamics. Now, the, the Boston Dynamics is also one of the companies that was bought by Google. Now Google is trying to get rid, is trying to sell Boston Dynamics. Why? Because they don't see any commercial applications in the near and intermediate future. And second, because they are, you know, people watch these videos and then they say, ah, but we, we don't want that. You know, we're scared. And Google is worried about their image in the general public and so they want to get rid of uh, this kind of company. Now what can we do? I think. We have a responsibility as engineers, as uh, entrepreneurs, but also the media have a responsibility. We have to really be realistic about the communication, understand people's mindsets, deliver on promises, and we need functionality that goes beyond facial expressions and smiling. Now, how can we do this? I think we need better robots. If you look at factory robots, they function perfectly. They are built of hard materials steel, hard plastics, electrical motors. If you look at humans by contrast, they are built 85% of soft materials. And the enormous power of the human sensory motor system is largely due to the fact that we are built from soft materials. So there is this area of soft robotics which is now really skyrocketing. Literally soft to touch, soft natural movements, but also safe interaction. Now, I have very little time, so let me just give you one example. Holding a hard object. When you hold a hard object, maybe I can get, you know, one from over here, a glass. Yes, it's effort, completely effortless. And you don't even need to know the, the exact shape. You can close your eyes. You just apply a particular force and then your fingers will adapt to the shape of the object. Moreover, we have soft deformable tissue in the hand and on the fingertips. So when we perform this movement, the tissue deforms and adapts to the shape of the glass. That's not controlled from here, that's at the periphery. Adaptivity at the periphery. Now, an experiment. Try to grasp a glass with thimbles. So, so thimbles are the things you use for sewing. De agudre. And if you put, this is very easy. If you put this, I have, by the way, I have some here. So if you want to try later, uh, you're welcome to do so. If you put uh, thimbles on all your fingers and then you try to grasp it, this is what happens. So first, I made a short video here first. Grasping. Okay, very easy. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's uh, completely effortless. Now watch this on the, on the uh, right. Let me play this again. Let's see. Oh, I want to play this. I have to play this again. This is... Okay. Just watch, watch Very the, easy. <laughs> watch the right panel here. I mean, it's virtually impossible. And then you start realizing what the materials do for you, for your sensory motor intelligence, so to speak. And that's what we call the power of materials, especially the power of soft materials. And you can't do that with hard technology, with hard thimbles on the fingers. That's why we started building this soft robotic gripper that with one and the same control, the point is with one and the same control, 
you can actually, in fact, grasp many different types of objects of very different kinds of shapes because the adaptivity is entirely at the periphery. It's this kind of robot that we need that to share the living space with us. This is under construction. Um, you'll see a little more in just a second. Now, many people speculate about the future. Journalists speculate, uh, researchers, engineers, Everybody, artists, they speculate about the future. There's a lot of speculation, but the point is, is there a way in which we can experience the future so that we can basically decide, do we want this or don't we want this? And we want to experience how it will be when we have very close, direct, emotional interaction with robots. And this is the purpose of a project that we call the RoboLounge. I have to be very careful here that I'm not adding to the robotic hype here. You have to be very realistic, but this is a vision of the future, an artist's vision of the future. Let me just play it for you. How will it be in the future when we actually live with robots? Do they have feelings? Robots hurt us. Here, police robot. Will they really understand me? Will they take care of me when I'm old? Will they take our jobs away? Can they see? Can they smell? Will it be scary to interact with them? Can I feel love for a robot? Start with the future with a drink in my robot. Erleben Sie die Zukunft mit einem Drink in meiner Robot. Post, cheers, gambe, salut, chin chin, sante, nastorovie, kampai. Okay, reminder, you know, concerning the robot hype, full-featured humanoids are nowhere in sight. Now the question is, how do we get there to the RoboLounge? So we're setting up a production company, Living with Robots, and in the interest of time, I will skip this. So cheers, and see you all in the RoboLounge in 2018. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Rolf. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, um, on a just oublié, évidemment, de vous annoncer que les, les deux conférences de ce soir sont en anglais. Uh, on fera des questions, on aura une table ronde après, après la présentation de, de Carmen et Domain. Et um, dans la foulée uh, du, du, de la table ronde qu'on fera avec eux, vous pourrez poser des questions et sentez-vous libre de les poser autant en français qu'en anglais. Et puis on tentera de faire les traductions dans les deux sens uh, aussi, uh, aussi bien qu'on pourra. Voilà, alors Carmen et Doma, Made in Group Ebitnik, c'est à vous, merci.
Oh. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for the really great introduction to uh, Sophie and Luc. Thank you, Rolf. Um, my name is Carmen. This is Doma. We're Median Group Bitnik uh, from Zurich. And um, we'd like to show you three of our works very briefly, as briefly as possible, um, that sort of uh, touch on robots. Um, Media Group Bitnik is um, an, an artist group. We work in and on the internet. So the internet is both um, the place for um, publication as much as material for our works. Um, we're very fascinated by the intersection of offline and online. Uh, we tend to work where online and offline meet, um, which today is everywhere, which used to be only in certain intersections. And um, yeah, we see the contemporary as our artistic material. So we're very interested in um, finding out how the contemporary works. And um, talking of robots, we done three works that sort of uh, talk of this. Okay, um, sorry. We're, <laughs> we're, sometimes we're not uh, entirely... <laughs> in, in sync, but, uh, <laughs> yes. full workout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to add in thanks to CCS for having us, for having the show upstairs. It was a real pleasure. And we are happy to be here again. Huh? So just let you know. Um, so we've been really interested in this uh, growing dominance of uh, robots or software bots. Um, of course, our field is the online work, so the robots or the bots we're talking about are mostly software-based. They don't, they're not embodied, they don't have bodies usually. Um, they're online, they're, they can be Google search bots, they can be uh, trading bots, they can be, I don't know, what else, algorithms, um, anything you find online. And as Sophie mentioned, uh, nearly half the population online now is software bots in some forms, um, scripts, programs, doing stuff. And this is what we're really interested in, in um, finding out how we relate to these scripts and bots and what they do with our spaces and how they mediate also what we can do online. So maybe you should go to yes. the first piece. So this was a piece we realized in 2013, uh, 2014, uh, in collaboration in an exhibition. We um, kind of co-curated in at the Kunsthalle St. Gallen called the Darknet, and there we were after the Snowden leaks. Uh, we wanted to kind of explore um, anonymous networks, networks with which give you like more encryptions where you are safer uh, from from state surveillance. And so we put together a show which would mostly deal with um, with with the deep web, uh, the, the uh, subculture of the of the internet, with the internet in the internet. And uh, we produce for, for there. We produce this this piece, which is called uh, the Random Darknet Chopper. Um, basically, the Random Darknet Chopper was an online shopping bot, and uh, we gave it a budget of 100 US dollars in bitcoins in in the darknets. Uh, the bitcoins are the currency, and uh, we sent it on shopping sprees once a week to the darknet to the largest darknet market and uh, it chose one item a week and had it sent directly to the exhibition space. So the idea was to have like a bot which would explore this strange marketplaces which are similar to the black markets we know um, in physical space but now uh, being online uh, we had questions about trust. How, how is trust built within anonymous networks? How do you build trust when you don't know who the seller is and who the buyer is because everything is encrypted, uh, everybody has, has, uh, has a nickname, there's no physical evidence of things, it's just like a globalized market. And uh, yes, we wanted to, to, to 
um, basically to to kind of evaluate these new kind of forms of trust within within anonymous networks. Yeah. And um, this especially also came in a time after the Snowden revelations where the online um, seemed to us uh, less uh, a Heimat, we say in German, a, a home uh, for our artistic practice and much more a, a home to anyone surveilling other people online. And we sort of um, thought, you know, what also does it mean this transition to the deep webs? Are they an alternative or... Is, is this a place to go? And um, we basically started uh, in October 2014. The, the bots went shopping for the first time uh, on a market called Agora at the time. So, and the bot had like super limited functions. It was uh, like a simple piece of software which would mimic human behavior uh, with a browser. So it would log in to the specific website, which was hosted in the darknet, log in, uh, check his balance, see if there's like enough bitcoins around uh, in 100 US dollars, then like jump into a random category, which were listed there, uh, parse all the items which are, um, uh, which are visible, and then choose a random item by it, send a message to the to the vendor and uh, let it send directly to the exhibition space. So in the, in the exhibition we had uh, those vitrines waiting, which were empty in the beginning, so each week uh, during the exhibition time um, one of those items uh, was ordered and should be filled over time. So um, basically the first, yeah, this is, a, yeah, that was the bot. <laughs> Basically, this laptop uh, was where the, the bot ran from. Uh, on, on its laptop interface, it would always say what its status was, so it would keep track of the items it had ordered, you know, which had arrived, which hadn't. And uh, the first item it bought was um, actually is still one of our favorites. It's a Fire Brigade master key set. So here you see the, the site from the Darknet market uh, offering this Fire Brigade master key set. It's a key set from UK Fire Brigade and it promises to give access to communi communal gates and storage areas, which we thought was a very... Um, nice promise for the, you know, something you get out of the deep web. We, we don't know if it works. Um, this, this is how the package looked like when it arrived and uh, then it was um, put into the vitrine. The second item was um, um, cigarettes from Ukraine, uh, cigarettes um, as a very standard kind of product within black markets or dark markets within war. And so they were shipped for 30 US dollars, I think. Uh, the third item is a Louis Vuitton Trevi handbag. Uh, so a luxury handbag, probably um, a fake, shipped from the US for $95. Um, the vendor gave back the money on this item because uh, he or she couldn't ship. Um, apparently, um, the person had gone out of stock. Um, the fourth one, what was it the fourth one? Yeah, a, the collection of the Lord of the Rings for one dollar as a PDF. So this is a printout of um, all the texts which were sent. Uh, the fifth item was a Visa Platinum card. Uh, so basically the card number, name of the person, uh, expiry date and the little number on the back I can't remember the name of so you could uh, basically go shopping with this card or maybe you couldn't we didn't uh, try it so this kind of process was really intense for us since we didn't know what this thing is going to buy and uh, I mean like we had no overviews the darknet markets they don't have the best reputation but we wanted to see if it's really that bad or I mean like uh, and and he, this this was the item where I was kind of the most most afraid um, because I mean like you could really damage a person by um, financially damage somebody by using his credit card and do stuff with it. Um, this item is the sixth item. It was um, 
10 yellow Twitter ecstasy pills that it bought. So uh, MDMA, a, a drug, party drug, um, which of course is like the other very typical item that you think you would get in a dark net market. Um, we actually, I mean, there are probably a lot of drugs being sold in the dark net markets and it's one of the areas that dark net markets have um, changed because it's a lot better to buy online, I mean, as a person wanting to take drugs from a trusted vendor because you can rate your vendor, you can rate the stuff the person sells, so you, you know, you can see who sells good stuff, you buy from that person and it's delivered to your, well, hopefully not to your home, to your neighbor's uh, uh, <laughs> post box or something, yeah. somebody else's post box, but basically, this has really changed the darknet markets, but we have to say that in in this in the 25 weeks of random darknet shopping, we've actually the most items have been, um, you know, the stuff you're interested in when you're a young person. You know, the pop cultural, the the, the cool jeans, the cool shoes. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, and uh, I'm like the nice thing is uh, uh, along this this kind of item below the, the item on the website there were like 400 comments of users describe uh, I mean like basically describing their experiences on the drug. So it was kind of a feedback channel. So people tried to to share their experiences with the thing, and they would say, "Oh, you can trust this vendor. His stuff is really good. It, you know, it's kind of it's pure and it has no uh, other other things in it." Yeah, so the drugs arrived and we um, exhibited them like the other items. Um, yeah, this is already a picture from after the exhibition where the drugs were gone. <laughs> but we'll finish. We'll come back. Yeah, yeah. we'll come back. Um, the next item were Nike Air GC2. Uh, these are Nike trainers designed by Kanye West and uh, sold for, I don't know, I, I think around $2,000 on eBay, limited edition. Uh, on the dark net, you can get them for $75 from China in unlimited edition. Yeah. Um, then we had like this one I really liked, a uh, uh, cap camcorder with a hidden spy camera in the hole. Um, from the US from the and US. Uh, the ninth item was a decoy letter, uh, something called, or the vendor called a decoy letter. So the idea was to, you know, before you go and buy the drugs, you get some anonymous post um, mailbox in your town or somewhere else. And then you use the decoy letter, this service by this person online, uh, will send you letters to that uh, box to get the post person to start getting used to delivering your mail there. So you start addressing stuff to yourself, to that box. And this service is, especially from the dark net, it makes you know, the letters come from more random uh, areas of the world. And one of the last items in this um, kind of 12, uh, 12 items continuation for the Kunsthalle St. Gallen was this Sprite stash can where you could basically hide stuff. So it was a Sprite stash can which was empty in the middle but had the same weight as a normal Sprite uh, a stash can. You could hide your jewelry, money or whatever inside. And diesel men jeans, um, probably really uh, the type you need to wear today. Um, and the last item uh, was a Hungarian passport, a scan of a Hungarian passport. So this one is gone. So during during the exhibition, the media jumped on the random darknet chopper, uh, mostly uh, uh, US-based media, because they were really interested in the moment, basically. I mean, like the he first headline was, oh, well, it's 2014 and we have drug buying robots now. Um, oh, and sorry. they would... Uh, ask the question about, I mean, like, who's responsible in this moment? Is it, is it the code, who, uh, the bot who executes him, himself? Is it, the, is it the artists or is it the museum who kind of hosts this whole thing? Um, and they basically were looking for a, a precedence case um, 
um, compare, comparing self-driving cars, you know, I mean, like, thing which are coming, I mean, like, who, who is responsible there when it's self-driving cars, which is run by algorithms when it produces uh, a crash and or kills somebody? I mean, like, who is it? Is it the programmer? Which programmer? I mean, like, it's is it the company? Is it the guy who bought the car? So these are all, like, these, these new questions which are popping up. And then um, the day after the exhibition closed in St. Gallen, uh, the public prosecutor had the whole exhibition seized and um, took it away. And for a while, we didn't know exactly what the problem was. Um, we were actually a bit relieved that uh, the drugs were the problem and not the credit card, um, because uh, the drugs, I mean, for us as artists were much easier also to um, to talk about and to probably uh, deal with. And we had to own up to being the programmers or the authors of Random Darknet Chopper and were then summoned, summoned also for a, a, a hearing yeah, with the... In the meanwhile, they, uh, the, pol the police also tested the drugs and they were... Um, it was kind of a pure pill, there were pure pills, uh, not 120 milligrams MDMA, only 100 milligram, uh, milligrams inside, but still the quality of the stuff was kind of really good. Um, yeah. So, they, so yeah. like they confirmed it, but uh, we already knew that through the... Through ratings. The, through the ratings, I mean like, come on. Yeah. And the Daily Dot wrote, uh, as you can see, drug buying robots arrested in Switzerland. So now the legal questions really became, um, or got a different flavor. We, um, of course, argumented um, with the public prosecutor for freedom of art. We think no, that... That we wanted the art pieces back, that if they take away the drugs, they're destroying an art piece at this moment. Yeah, and that we think it's important for art to be able to um, do these kinds of things, to raise these uh, questions publicly in exhibitions. And at some moment he kind of also, um, he said in an interview, I think with, I don't know which magazine it was, but that he was kind of happy to be part of this art piece and that he totally understands the conceptual value of the work and that he thinks that he needs to um, kind of destroy the drugs because as a, as a public pro prosecutor he cannot give back, I mean, like, uh, seized drugs, but that we should maybe hang uh, the seizure letter uh, in the next exhibition so this kind of thing could work conceptually. So we thought, I mean, okay. It's a good art. <laughs> it's a good, I mean, like, it's a good, good thing. Yeah. Um. All items were released back to us um, after about three months, um, and except for the drugs, and um, we were not charged with possession of drugs uh, because of freedom of art was ruled um, more important than uh, charging us with possession of drugs, which would have been strange, by the way, because we never actually handled the drugs. Yeah. How, how much do we speak already? <laughs> we'll hurry. Yeah, yeah. So, so this was a random action shop, and we kind of prolonged this. Uh, um, this oh. um, we did like another uh, two exhibitions with items uh, which we bought, but I think we'll jump to the next yes. two projects. Oh. Um, the next work we would like to show you very briefly is called Same Same. Um, it's actually explained very quickly. It's an online piece we did for uh, the Gabriel Voltaire website, which you see here. Uh, Tim, okay. Oh, okay. And um, so basically, uh, we were asked by Gabriel Voltaire to contribute to their website as a, an artistic intervention into their website. And uh, we decided to exchange all images on the website by, um, uh, through, by uh, Google similar images. So basically we fed the images they have on the website into the Google machine and got the most similar image back from Google. And uh, the idea behind this was to um, 
find a way of looking or talking about this secret algorithm that Google has for image searches. So uh, they don't disclose how it really works. And we wanted to know what the Google image machine sees, so what their Google bot sees in images. And um, we can so, show you a few so, examples. So just like, uh, as you see here in the website screenshot, the Cabaret Voltaire logo was replaced with a Volkswagen logo. All the sponsors on the website have been kind of replaced with similar sponsors, but not the same foundations, things like that. And I mean, like here you, uh, maybe with this stream of images, we can kind of feel uh, what, what the Google uh, um, algorithm sees. So um, this is Hans Arp at the left. Um, um, this is another image by Hans Arp. Um, um, which was replaced. So always left is original, right is thing. So here you see it like this is an ob the object. Uh, this is Oscar Wilde. So it's almost the same image, but not the same. But he, he kind of recognizes Oscar Wilde. Uh, Peter Fent, um, the Chapman brothers. And this is Dick van Baburen. Uh, Irvin, artists, Rose Selavi. So it doesn't work as well with buildings. <laughs> that unboxing was important. Yeah. So you get this idea of um, you s like looking through these thousand images they have on their website. You suddenly get this idea of what. Google sees, you know, which elements of a of an image are important. Um, what what does it um, sort of stick to when finding a, a an image that's similar? Yeah, you get the idea. And as the last um, piece, we actually wanted to talk quickly about uh, the exhibition here at. Um, Centre Culturel Suisse, which is like um, a next step for us within this research into bots. Um, it started out with the Ashley Madison um, website, which uh, Sophie and Luke also briefly mentioned. So an adultery a, a dating website for married people. And um, they were hacked, and the hack gave us as artists access to their data and to the way they work. So basically this is a, it's a startup company, very typical for startup companies, which goes out and wants to disrupt, um, um, you know, a, a field. They go out and they say, we can make this better. And they, they try to very aggressively find or define new rules for earning more money. Ashley Madison did, did this through bots, um, which the public learnt from the hack. So through the hack, it became clear that there were actually not very many women on this site. So uh, there were like 40 million users and only uh, 40 million users and through the database dump, which was kind of made public, um, researchers and people would find out and see that there were only 3,000 women and 75,000 bots acting on this platform, speaking to 40 million men. Oh. And I think for us what really fascinated us was on the one hand to have this example of how bot-human rela relationships really are today. So this is not the future, it's like now you can go to Ashley Madison, make an account, talk to bots. Um, and how this sort of the discrepancy between um, you know what bots promise and what they're actually used for really um, really uh, animated us to uh, work on this topic. And here at CCS, um, the idea was to take the 61 Ashley Madison bots that uh, live in Paris. So they have a Paris address, and they were addressed to. Um, the users in Paris and give them um, um, a presence within a space. So uh, we wanted um, people in Paris to be able to go and visit the Paris Ashley Madison bots. Hmm? Yeah. 
So basically, if you, if you go upstairs, you will see it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's 61 bots speaking the same text. So these are the pickup lines which were hardly coded into the software. Um, so whenever you would appear from Paris, a P Parisian chatbot would try to start a, a conversation with you. And um, um, they would say uh, simple things like, hey, hi, how are you? Are you online? Are you busy? Do you want to talk? Have you been on this site for a long time? And then uh, kind of this, this conversation would start. And uh, the bots, they all speak like those engagement sentences um, uh, in the video installation. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, maybe you should go and check it out. Yeah. Also. <laughs> voilà, super. Merci beaucoup, Carmen et Doma. On va juste demander peut-être à Rolf aussi de venir, de venir s'asseoir devant avec nous. On est un peu en retard sur notre, notre horaire, donc on va faire court. On va peut-être juste poser une question avant de, avant de vous laisser poser des questions au, au, à nos conférenciers. Voilà. Euh, moi, je voulais peut-être juste demander, peut-être, euh, peut-être à Rolf. Là, on a, on a vu quelque chose de, de très différent au niveau des, euh, des intelligences qui se manifestent, par exemple, dans, dans un travail comme, euh, comme ces codes sur lesquels travaille Bitnik. Et puis, par exemple, j'étais assez frappé par l'exemple justement à nouveau du, du Darknet Shopper, où finalement même les transactions que font ce robot le mènent souvent à acheter encore des objets qui sont eux-mêmes des objets transactionnels, des clés qui ouvrent des espaces, des drogues qui ouvrent d'autres espaces mentaux, etc., etc. Puis finalement, on est tout le temps dans un processus relativement génératif. Rolf, pour, avec tout le temps que tu as investi finalement à travailler ces robots qui, par exemple, saisissent des bars, dans des, euh, saisissent des verres dans des bars, donc vraiment des développements physiques aussi qui sont, qui sont extrêmement précis, qui sont extrêmement importants, euh, pour des situations qui finalement ne changent pas, qu'est-ce qui se passerait si tout ce travail était fait pour arriver finalement dans une situation où il n'y a plus le bar, où il n'y a plus les verres, etc. Là, il me semble qu'il y a une... Il y a quelque chose là. Je n'ai pas bien compris la question. En termes de... Je pense que dans leur travail, ils sont vraiment dans une sorte de... An always involving series of transactions, basically with the with the with the coding they do, where basically even the end situations always end, uh, always change. Uh, with the work you're doing, which is very focused, for, for example, on on specific gestures that that need to be accomplished by uh, embodied machines that need to be designed in an ever more precise way. What if uh, all this effort being made? Uh, then result in maybe the perfect robot landing in a situation where basically the situation they were designed for is non-existent actually, where it's passed. Uh, so what, what their robot is, uh, that the situation changes, that the robot is not designed for, or what? That, that maybe the tasks it was designed for are actually not relevant anymore, and that all the effort went into something that is not relevant anymore. Well, because the environment has changed, I'm not sure I really understand the point of the question okay. that you're asking. <laughs> so I design a robot for a particular you know, set of situations, and then the environment changes, and then the robot becomes useless, maybe. Is that the question? Or, or It's what? possible, yeah. Huh? In, in terms then of the, um, <laughs> the, inten the intelligences you, 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 you develop, so could you speak a little bit more about the type of intelligence that features in these robots, which is really embodied uh, intelligence? You've talked a lot about mm. artificial intelligence yeah. having to be not only mapped on the brain, but uh, okay. an extension of the okay. entire body. Okay, I think we have a real problem here, and that what people interpret into these robots that we have with today's technology is much, much more, that's you know what I'm talking about, the expectations that people have from Hollywood, Hollywood movies, where the robots are really intelligent and you know, they act like human beings. Now, if you look at current technology of you know, these social robots, we are nowhere, and that's why I had that you know, several times, you know, there, these robots, general purpose robots, they're nowhere near in sight. And what we do in order to make the, I mean, they didn't have time, 
you know, we just had 15 minutes, so I didn't have time to explain that. The, um, what these robots do, like the bartender robot, that's, well, you can call it cheating, or you can use a scientific term which is called scaffolding. And what, actually, we use two concepts. One is soft robotics, and the other one is scaffolding. So soft robotics, I think I briefly explained, is that you have a lot of adaptivity at the periphery of the system, and the materials take over a lot of the adaptive function, which means that you can interact with numbers. I mean, we had this, this robot arm, the soft robot arm, pick up bottles, heavy bottles, glasses, cigarettes, you know, paper cups, all with one and the same control. So very simple control, but a lot of adaptivity object situations that the robot has never seen before, but it works perfectly well. You can say, well, that's cheating, but it's just exploiting materials. So that's one thing, soft robotics. The other one, uh, scaffolding, uh, means that you can exploit the particular situation. And I think we have a nice example of scaffolding in the bot technology. We also, in robotics, we call them also chatterbot, chatterbot technologies. So basically what you have is templates, or you, know, you have a database, I don't know, a thousand, maybe five thousand, or templates, input, output patterns, and then all the robot needs to do or the bot needs to do is recognize keywords, and then it searches the database for particular patterns. And when the context, I mean, and that's very important, you know that the context is very limited. And in the bartender robot context, the um, it, you, know, you can't talk about the, the, the American election with the bartender, but you can talk about drinks. So the bartender can say, well, say, uh, yeah, you know, I would like a beer, and then there is a pattern with the beer that says, well, we, today we have the following beers on special, and you know, that kind of thing. And then, because the context is there, it looks as if the robot were much more intelligent than it actually is. We also call this show-enhanced intelligence. So basically, making people believe that the robots are more intelligent than they actually are. And that's what we can do today. And we don't have the general purpose bartender. So I think if the situation, well, the situation changes and the customer wants to say, well, yeah, what do you think about the American election? Maybe we could, of course, put in a few patterns now about the American election, but you know, if the, the customer comes up with something completely different, it, won't, it says, okay, well, I, I just uh, talk about drinks. We would have sort of a default thing if the customer asks something that uh, he doesn't know anything about, he will just say, well, let's talk about drinks or something like that. But so the intelligence of this thing is very limited, and I think the intelligence of the bots that you were talking about is also in that sense very limited and you know they have sort of tricks of coming back of sort of sort of uh, let's say bringing the conversation back to the template so that they can apply these templates yeah i think both of your presentations and also works makes very clear and you said it many times tonight the expectations are much higher than the actual right. capability of these machines and uh, same for Ashley Madison, if you go upstairs and you see the, hear those dialogues, it's very, very basic. And my question maybe to both of you is, why are we having all these big expectations? Is it media? Is it the movies? Is it maybe our dream to have those machines around us? Any theories? Well, the, uh, I, th I think one of the points is that we, of, of course we can speculate, right? But I think the point is that we, we want to experience. It's, it's very, a very, very different situation from talking about something or maybe seeing a Hollywood movie and from experiencing the actual interaction with a machine. So I think we need to provide spaces in which we can experience these interactions, you know, and, and uh, then we can really decide. And it has to be a real-life situation. It cannot be just a game situation because that doesn't concern me, really. You know, it's just a game situation. It has to be a real-life situation, like a robo-lounge, where people can experience that. They have to pay for their drinks, and, you know, they talk to the customers, so, and they, they want to get their drink, and the drink has to be good, and, you know. <laughs> uh, 
I think oh, sorry. Um I think yeah, 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 better. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think at least talking of the online world, we already live in a very algorithmically driven world. So these bots, um, if they're single purpose, they're actually very good. You know, the, the Google bot that recognizes images and gives you back um, similar images, it's it's actually quite quite good. And you can see, you can also, looking at the images, you see it comes from a, it has, the bot has this history of surveillance. So it's very good at faces, uh, expressions, movement, anything to do with humans. It's very bad at houses because that's not interesting to a, to a surveillance um, context. and. So we, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I actually fear the opposite. I fear we don't, our expectations are too low. You know, like after the Snowden revelations, I mean, we, we all, I think we all knew that there was surveillance going on online, but I do have to say I was surprised by the extent and the depth and the, the way it really um, goes through everything and, that was a shock, so I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think, yes, for general purpose, um, robots, probably the expectations are too high, and that, you know, has to do with Hollywood and with this um, selling of this narrative, but actually, I think, in, in the dark, the, the, there are functions that robots do that they're actually really good at. I think I think we probably have to be a bit careful here. Um, and, I mean, there's one thing that, you know, surveillance is everywhere, but that's done by humans mostly, and of course they use algorithms. But these algorithms aren't really extremely intelligent. Now, examples that we always get is like from deep learning, you know, or deep neural networks. That's sort of the big thing. And so they show them images, you know, thousands of images, or from, uh, you know, in the medical area, from body image, imaging, you know, to detect cancer patterns and things like that. And they do a lot of learning and indeed they often do a very good job. But we have to be, I mean, there is no universal learning algorithm. And now people always think, oh, now we have these deep neural networks and they just learn everything. We don't even need to tell them anything. They detect all these patterns on their own. Now there are many experiments that show that these programs can be fooled very easily. So for example, you just, let's say in, in uh, one of these uh, algorithms, these are algorithms, not robots really. I mean, bot is maybe not a really good name because it suggests a robot, it's just an algorithm. I mean, you also mentioned that. And that if you, you know, maybe the, um, the program has learned what, what a car or a bus is. And then by just putting sort of a kind of network over the, the image, which is not visible to humans. So humans see exactly the same thing, the bus, but, and there are experiments that show that, the, um, the um, algorithm sees an ostrich on wheels. And because the algorithm doesn't have common sense, it doesn't bother it that an ostrich has wheels, right? And for a human, the image hasn't changed. So, and we, it's, it's very easy, in fact, to fool these algorithms. So the question is, I mean, you mentioned the, the notion of trust. To what extent can we trust these machines that have learned these things? And one of the big problems is then they act in certain ways. And I think you were also surprised that your you know, bots acted in certain ways. And you don't know why. You have no idea why they act in these ways. And so I think we have to be a bit more careful now. There is a huge hype. I mean, <laughs> artificial intelligence is a history of hypes. And we have to be careful that we're not entering another hype. I think the deep neural network learning stuff, it's very powerful. I've, I mean, I've been teaching you know, neural networks for 25 years. And um, they are very powerful and they're very good. They work when you have a lot of data and you have good data, 
and finding out what the good data are, I think, is a really, really, really important thing. We just say, well, now with the Internet of Things, we have data, 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 you know, we collect data driving around, I don't know what. But we don't know how good the data are. I think that's one of the major problems. And then they can be fooled easily. So I think we're, again, in a big hype here, and all the media, you know, they pick this up, but they love it, or they hate it, or, you know, it's very, a very emotional topic. But I think we should be careful here. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? It was very interesting uh, to know all these things, and uh, I think uh, uh, the professor has, uh, is right uh, in saying that uh, there is a big hype. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, even in this uh, uh, seminar, let's say so, uh, there was one thing uh, uh, I think very fundamental that uh, at least I didn't understand, you know, the difference. And now the professor has explained a little bit uh, better of bot and robot. I mean, for uh, normal people, uh, uh, I personally just uh, knew robot as uh, some kind of uh, uh, definition and uh, idea. But the bot was completely uh, unknown to me, and that's why I came here to understand what the bot was. And uh, I don't know, I thought maybe bot was uh, something French uh, to, at first, <laughs> to uh, to signify robot, and then the professor uh, explained, now you know it's an algorithm. So for me an algorithm is uh, just a piece of uh, program. Uh, and robot is much more than, than this. I mean, uh, a robot is a mixture of, uh, of course, algorithms, uh, programs, uh, but also mechanics, uh, you know, things engineeringly um done you know by by mechanics by electronics and uh, so it's uh, i first uh, first question would be you know i uh, would like to have a, a better uh, definition of uh, bot and robot i think robot is uh, almost i think universally known but i think bot uh, it should be defined a little bit better for normal people i mean uh, i think this conference is done also for normal people not just uh, specialists and then um, uh, one thing uh, in common with bot and robots uh, as the professor mentioned um, there is a, a very big hype but i don't know how uh, I mean, the economics of this uh, hype. I mean, who has the interest to invest, spend a lot of money, you know, in doing this research? I would like to understand, for instance, the, the Bitnik research, or even your research, Professor. I mean, you probably have sponsors and, uh, you know, it's fundamental research. Uh, but, uh, you know, the example that uh, you did, you know, for instance, Google uh, buying robotics and then uh, have, uh, um, you know, second thoughts of it. Uh, for me, as a normal uh, person, you know, I would say, why, uh, you know, uh, just uh, having, uh, you know, a good example for, uh, for uh, an investor that is uh, universally known uh, like Warren Buffett, you know. You don't invest in things uh, if you don't understand uh, uh, well what these things uh, do and what these things uh, will will do for. I mean, you should have uh, some more uh, precise um, goal, you know, as the professor mentioned, you know, economically speaking. Uh, but all these experiments, I think, uh, are uh, a little bit... Uh, too advanced, and uh, I don't think they they can uh, bring uh, uh, economical return. Uh, I, I would like an explanation of uh, the economics uh, after the definition of bots. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as 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 we, I, I think you you said it right. As we understand, bots are um, software based pieces which are mostly all run by algorithms, some set of functions or mathematical functions and have some tasks and which are very good in 
automating things, doing things uh, out in the wild, uh, gathering data. Um, do um, in the financial world there are a lot of trading bots. They analyze the trading market and then they decide based on a hidden or for us unknown algorithm if they should buy the stock or not. So and they are like ten times, hundred thousand times faster than the humans are. So these are kind of all all the things which can be automated in a small sense with kind of also limited kind of function or limited kind of worldview um, are in our sense considered being bots and robots um, is the thing which has in the end like the mechanical I would say um, capabilities yeah yeah should I uh, I, I think I've, so I fully agree Yeah. Yes. No, it becomes a robot when it's autonomous. So I think that's the that's the difference between I would say an algorithm and a, and software bot is when it's programmed to autonomously react on a certain input. It searches in a certain data set or whatever. So talking of a trading bot, it would be. Um, you could trigger a trading bot by, I don't know, searching through Twitter to find whatever keyword, and every time you find that, it does something, or it decides on, on a certain set of rules that it will do something. And um, an algorithm is, I, I don't know, I mean, the, it's very, so you have all types now online, but I, I think generally you would say a software bot um, needs a certain type of autonomy between inputs and outputs. Yeah, whatever autonomy exactly means. Exactly. I mean, you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can comment on the uh, economic question. I, I think that's exactly, exactly an essential part of the robotic hype. It's unbelievable how, and I've been talking to, for the last two or three years, I've been talking to many investors uh, especially also in China. And the, 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 the reason people invest in something is not because they understand the technology or because they understand what it is about, but it's exactly a myth that this company is the future. I mean, look at a company like Tesla. They haven't earned a single you know, profit. They haven't made a single US dollar in profit, but the shares, you know, they're unbelievable and the, but people invest in the future and in something that they don't understand and with robotic that's exactly and so I, I mean I can guarantee if I look at all you know I showed all these robots where in all of these companies the people have invested and I, I mean, I've seen some of these companies, you know, they produce complete trash, you know, copies of European or US robots, cheap copies. They have no functionality. They can only sell, sell them because, you know, the Chinese market is very big. But even that market, I mean, the, the companies are just like, they're coming up like mushrooms. People invest in, in them and they invest in beliefs. They don't invest in technology. Uh, I mean, I talked to several investors. I mean, one investor said, okay, I told him about this uh, bartender robot. And then he said, yes, yeah, Rolf, I really like your, your story, but it's not big enough. I want a bigger story. And I said, yeah, maybe it's not really big, but it's realistic. And then he said, literally, I don't care whether it's realistic or not. I want a big story, and then I will invest. So they know that it's not going to work but that's what they're going to invest in. I mean, I, I, first I thought, you know, I don't believe this, but it's part of the robot hype. I have, I have done um, uh, many lectures also for banks, investment banks, and they have these brochures. Oh, there's one example. I read an article in uh, Financial Times about robots, and then I told my partner, uh, hey, have you seen this article? 
And then he said, oh, very interesting. Did you see the small print there? It's sponsored by UBS. So it was an article, a very technical article about robotics, sponsored by UBS. So they didn't say you have to invest in robotics, but it was a very positive image that they painted of robotics, much more positive than it actually is, and they want to get people to invest in this. That's also part of the robotic hype. I mean, and, and this is about billions and billions and billions. This is not just a small thing. And I think there is a bubble, and the bubble is going to burst. And I think it's, it's, no, it's not going to be fun and games if this bubble is actually going to burst. I think it's just too much hype. Okay. Pardon. On, on va juste prendre une autre that, question, peut-être. If, if at all, yes. If at all, and, and uh, I think the market will, in the end, decide. But I think a lot of these companies will default; they will go bankrupt. I, I had another another very short question: um, Do we need robotic bartender? Do we need robot bartenders? Well, that's a good question that we often get. You know, is this really the most urgent thing that uh, uh, mankind needs? Right? Yes, I think it's a good question. One of the reasons we do this is, first of all, I think it's a fun environment. It's a real-world environment. It requires very sophisticated sensory motor skills. There are good markets for it. There is you know, the beverage market. There is a coffee market. I mean, I can give you numbers about the coffee shop market. And one very important thing is the skills that a bartender needs are very easily transfer transferable to other areas, like hospitals, households, homes for the elderly, shops, and so on and so forth. And so I think it's a good starting point for something like that. In addition, it's a lot of fun, and people will like it. Une dernière question avant qu'on boucle. Um, if uh, our expectations about robotics uh, are so huge, why does the robots are childish design? Uh, is that because of lack of technology or is that uh, marketing questions like uh, people don't want to see a realistic robot uh, in reality? Question for me. Uh, Okay, most of these robots have this sort of childlike look. They look like toys, basically. And I think one of the, I mean, uh, this, is, this is speculation. I mean, I think what's important, you mentioned you are alluding to one point, and I think it's very important if you build a robot, also if you build a, a let's say, realistic bartender robot, that people immediately recognize that this is a robot and not a human being. I think people don't feel at ease if the robot resembles too closely. Like I think, uh, uh, Luke, in your uh, introduction, you showed this uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro's clone robot. I think if they look too much like human beings, people don't feel at ease anymore. So they should clearly recognize that it's a robot. And the reason by, of the child, childish look is people think it's cute, and people are not scared of it. And another reason is, is, is that originally the first sort of really child-like robot was made by a Japanese company, NEC. The robot was called Papero. It was, it was developed in 19... It was, came on the market in 1997. And I think most of the robots that came later, they were just sort of copies or inspired very closely by this kind of robot, Japanese robot. And, uh, you know, people like it. But the functionality, you have to see, I mean, they, they look cute, and then people project, and I think that's also an important point with, the, with your bots and, uh, you know, uh, Ashley Madison, or what it's called, uh, that people project their own feelings into these robots. There is a, a, a saying by a, a British biologist from Oxford University, he said, anthropomorphization, the incurable disease. So basically, we always project our own ideas into the environment. And then if they are cute and they have a bit human-like, people think they attribute characteristics and abilities to these robots that they obviously don't have. Which, by the way, in the night, you mentioned that uh, Josef Weizenbaum, 
That was in the 1960s. That was a really stupid computer program. People thought it was a real person. Ah, thank you, Rolf. Thank you, Carmen and Doma. Merci à vous. Um, on va s'arrêter là pour la partie conférence. On va faire une petite pause, le temps de réinstaller pour le concert de Not Waving. Il y a un bar dehors. Uh, donc, j'espère que vous restez tous avec nous. Et puis, on vous retrouve ici dans quelques minutes. Et puis, n'hésitez pas à continuer à poser des questions dehors. Merci.